So um, our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 73 and verse 28. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. It's great to be back with you uh, this morning. Uh, last time I was here, when I looked down, all I could see was a lot of cars, so it's good to see some faces today. Uh, our opening singing comes from Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And we'll be singing the A version of the psalm. Stanzas 1 to 5. If you are a child of God this morning, you've been healed from the affliction of your sin. You've been given new life, a new hope, and a new direction, and a new destiny. And in the Gospels, we are told when, when Jesus healed the ten lepers, only one came back to thank him. And like that, we can often be neglectful in coming to God to thank him for all that he's done for us. But that should be an everyday activity in the life of the Christian. And we see that in this psalm, the opening stanza. You will exalt my God, O King, and I will bless your name always. I'll bless you every single day. Your name forever I will praise. So let us join together in thankfulness this morning to praise the name of our great God, whose greatness fully search can none. Let's sing Psalm 145a. The first five stanzas. Prayer. Let's pray. 
O mighty God, great King above all gods, we come before you this morning as the one who has created this world, this beautiful creation that we can see this morning if we look outside, that you have made us and you are the great God over all the earth. You have created the things in heaven and the things on earth, the things visible and the things invisible. You are Lord of all of that. You are Lord over all the powers and thrones and rulers and authorities of this world. Lord, we bring before you our troubled world this morning. We bring before you the people of Ukraine and the troubles that they are going through. Lord, we pray when we know that you are a sovereign God, we pray that you would intervene in that situation and for those people, that you would bring peace to our world as only you can. Lord, we come before you this morning and we humble ourselves before you. Lord, so often we are pride and we, we think we can go our own way and we think we know better than the one who has created us and the one who has saved us. Lord, forgive us for that and humble us as we come into your presence this morning. We know that you alone deserve our wholehearted devotion. For us to love us, to us to love you with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our minds and all of our strength. Lord, we thank you that through Jesus we can come into your presence. That there is an open door through your grace shown to us in Jesus' death on the cross. That paid the penalty for the sin that we have committed. And means that we can come into your presence with his righteousness as our own. That we can come before a holy God despite the sinners that we are. Lord, we thank you that our Saviour lives today. That he did not die on the cross and stay dead. But that he rose on the third day. And at this very moment he is interceding for us. And watching over us. And keeping us. As we come and as we walk in his ways and follow him. Lord, we confess our sins to you this morning. We know that you have promised that if we come to you and confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, instill us with a greater love and knowledge of our Saviour. We pray that you would open our eyes to see who you are today as we look at, our, at your word. Lord, as your name is lifted up across the world this morning, as people saved by you, lift up your name and sing your praise. Lord, may others be brought into your family by your great mercy. We pray you be with us as we look at your word together. We pray that you would encourage us where we need encouraged. Pray you would challenge us where we need challenged. And strengthen us as we go into your new week that we would be offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to you and not letting our minds be conformed to the pattern of this world but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll be reading the first 11 verses. First Peter chapter 5 from verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, 
not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the pride, but shows favour to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, he will restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. Our second singing is from Psalm 119, uh, part 2a. Psalm 119 and part 2a. The longest chapter in the whole Bible, and it's dedicated to the Word of God. And as we come to look um, at the passage we'll be considering after this, it's good to focus on what we need God's Word for. Stanza 1 asks the question, how can a youth his life keep pure? And the answer is in the second line, if with your word he guards his way. God's word is how we know what God's will is for us, how to live as God's people. And we are called on the psalm to meditate and store up God's word in our hearts. Are we doing that? Are we coming to God's word each day to strengthen us and to show us how we should live as God's people and what we shouldn't be doing? what sin is and how God wants us to live. So let's sing Psalm 119, part 2a, uh, to the tune Hesperus 14. Let's sing.
come now to the passage we'll be looking at uh, in the sermon today, uh, Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm 37, and we'll begin at verse 1. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell on the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the bow, draw the sword and bend the bow, to bring down the poor and the needy, to slay those whose ways are upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts, and their bows will be broken. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The blameless spend their days under the Lord's care, and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. But the wicked will perish, though the Lord's enemies are like the flowers of the field. They will be consumed they will go up in smoke. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be destroyed. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young, And now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be a blessing. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Wrongdoers will be completely destroyed. The offspring of the wicked will perish. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouths of the righteous utter wisdom and their tongues speak what is just. The law of their God is in their hearts. Their feet do not slip. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous intent on putting them to death, but the Lord will not leave them in the power of the wicked or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Hope in the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a luxuriant native tree, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless, observe the upright. A future awaits those who seek peace.
but all sinners will be destroyed. There will be no future for the wicked. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Amen. Over the last month, our news has been dominated by Putin's invasion of Ukraine. At this very moment, the Ukrainian people are battling for their cities and their country. And despite international outcry and <coughs> severe economic sanctions, Putin has been undeterred in his efforts. And watching the scenes, we can feel, we can feel helpless what can we do? We can feel angry. Why is this being allowed to happen? We can feel worried. What will be next? Or we could be depressed. What has this world come to? And there are many other conflicts across the world that maybe don't make our news headlines that would make us feel the same way. We look at the world around us and we see so much wickedness and injustice. And not only that, we see guilty people getting away with it. Not only that, they're prospering. People are getting into power by trampling over others and using their power when they get it for evil purposes. Well, often the godly are marginalized and suffer hardships. It was Martin Luther who said, for every man on every occasion, can find in the book of Psalms words which fit his needs, which feels to be as appropriate as if they had been set there just for his sake. Now some Psalms are Psalms of praise, like Psalm 145, which we started our service with. Psalms praising God for what he has done for us. Other Psalms are praying Psalms, like Psalm 69, calling out to God when we're in trouble. Of our psalms, confessing psalms, like Psalm 51, confessing our sins to God and, uh, and asking for forgiveness. Well, what is Psalm 37 that we have just read? Well, it is a teaching psalm. And what does it teach us? Well, it teaches us how to respond in a world in which the wicked are prospering and advancing while the righteous are in disgrace and adversity. How do we reconcile these two things? What are we to do in dark times such as this? When I was doing short-term service in Galway, uh, me and Billy Hamilton or Peter Jemfrey would often go round the doors in Galway with a questionnaire. And I think it was the last question on the questionnaire was, if you could ask God one question and get an answer, what would it be? And one of the most popular responses to that question was, why do bad things happen to good people? Or the flip side of that, why do bad people get away with what they do? Now many of these people didn't believe in God, but the question still remained in their, in their minds. Even if in an atheistic worldview the question is not valid at all, there isn't good or evil. There's no ultimate moral standard. But even so, the question remained in their minds, and it can be in our minds as well. Why do bad things happen to good people? But we shouldn't be surprised when these times come if we've read our Bibles. Jesus said to his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. And so they did. As they obeyed Jesus' words to take the gospel to the nations, they suffered terrible hardships. Our Savior was a suffering Savior, and we as followers of him are called to take up our cross and follow him. It's not that when you come to faith in Jesus, 
that it's a vaccine that makes you immune to the world's sufferings. Everything in my life's going to go smoothly from now on. No, that's not right. Yes, there'll be times of blessing and great joy, but there'll be other times. There'll be difficult times, challenging experiences, times like this psalm describes. It's not a new thing. It was obviously the same in David's day as he wrote this psalm, and it's been the case many times since. And we can often feel in such times that we're getting overwhelmed, that we've reached our limit, and we can start questioning God. Why is this happening? Why are you letting this happen? And we quickly get resentful and discouraged. This psalm, though, offers us some encouragement and understanding for times such as this. Now, you may have noticed as we read through the psalm that it doesn't, as other psalms helpfully do, uh, split into nice little neat sections. Um, it's more like a splurge of meditation about this subject, the prosperity of the wicked. Well, the reason for that is that this psalm is actually an alphabetical acrostic, um, an acrostic poem in which each line starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, obviously, that doesn't come across when we translate it into the English. But we're going to look at this psalm under uh, three, four points, four points. Firstly, we'll look at what not to do when the wicked prosper. Then we'll look at why. Thirdly, an alternative course of action. And then finally, a promise. So we'll start with what not to do. And we're given play, a plain instruction repeated three times in the psalm. Verse 1. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. Verse 7, do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. And in verse 8, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. In the psalm, we see evil and injustice, oppression and wickedness prevalent. And evildoers are flourishing and prospering. They're continuing unchecked. There seems to be no repercussions. Instead, their power and their wealth only seems to increase. And they haven't got their power justly. We see in, in verse 7, talk of wicked schemes. Verse 14, bringing down the poor and the needy. Verse 21, exploiting others. Verse 32, lying in wait for the righteous. They've got where they are by trampling over the weak and the helpless, the virtuous and the good. A society in which immorality is glorified, while godly men and women are marginalized or even persecuted. It's not unlike the direction our world is heading in. How do we naturally react to such a thing? Well, we fret. Fret is not a word we use much nowadays. You might think of a guitar before you uh, think of it in this way that the passage is describing. But the Hebrew word used here literally means to get heated up, to get heated up, to start to boil on the inside, to get angry and frustrated and annoyed. Why is God allowing this to happen? Why are they getting away with it? Why is nothing being done about it? One place you're sure to see people getting heated up is if you're sitting beside a passionate football supporter as they watch their team and a refereeing decision doesn't go their team's way. Now do they pause and reflect for a moment, considering the rules of the game, evaluate whether the refereeing decision is in line with those rules before calmly commenting on their conclusions. No, they don't. They shout and yell at the TV. The referee must be biased to hold a grudge against our team for some reason. And the resentment doesn't stop there. The annoyance, the distress, the frustration, 
the resentment may last the rest of the day and beyond. That's what getting heated up looks like. And David could look back to a moment in his life where he got heated up. 1 Samuel 25 records it when David encountered a man called Nabal. Now David had done Nabal an excellent service. He protected and taken care of Nabal's flocks. But Nabal, instead of rewarding David, had insulted him. And David burned with anger, and he picked up his sword, and he said to his men, let's go and teach this guy a lesson. And he would have killed Nabal and his household in his anger, had Nabal's wife not intervened. But God says to us, no, don't get heated up when you see the prosperity of the wicked. Don't go down that road. It only leads to evil. Because like David, there is a danger that in your anger you will fall into the same sins and the same sinful course that those you are angry at are on. Another temptation that's mentioned in the psalm is to be envious of those who do wrong. We see that in verse 1. We can look at the wicked and think, these people seem to be free to do what they like. They're indulging in their, they're indulging all their desires and they look like they're enjoying themselves. Meanwhile, here's me disciplining myself each day, restraining myself and following God's ways. I want to be like them. I want to be with them. I want to flourish like they are flourishing. And the temptation quickly grows, the temptation to envy the wicked. But this psalm says, don't. God knows that we can be tempted in both these ways, so he warns us against it in this psalm. But why? Why should we not fret? Why should we not be envious? Well, we see throughout the psalm the reasons why. Verse 2, For like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Verse 9, For those who are evil will be destroyed. Verse 10, A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Verse 20, The wicked will perish, though the Lord's enemies are like the flowers of the field. They will be consumed. They will go up in smoke. And finally, verses 35 and 36. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a luxuriant native tree, but he soon passed away and was no more. I looked for him, but he could not be found. You see, we have no reason to fret about or envy the wrongdoer in their prosperity because the prosperity that they have will be short-lived. Wicked here are compared to the grass of the field or the flower of the field, which flourishes for a brief moment and then withers away. And such is the satisfaction that comes from sin. It is fleeting, and earthly treasures are confined to this short life. At the moment of death, they are gone. At the moment of death, the joy of the evildoer will end, and all their worldly prosperity will be gone. David had observed this in his own life. He could think of Saul, a great king, powerful and prosperous. But when he was killed in battle against the Philistines, all of it was gone. And it's not just that. God is a perfectly just God. Many people in our world today are complacent like the people in Zephaniah's day who said, the Lord will not do good or evil. He's not interested in what I'm doing. But that's not true. God is not uninterested in how we live our lives. He's not oblivious to how we live. And everyone will have to stand before him and give account for what they have done and face the consequences of their actions. For every sin, there is a price to pay. And there is no doubt that the ruin of the wicked is inevitable 
and it will be complete. Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, the psalmist is struggling in a similar way, looking at the prosperity of the wicked. And the turning point in the psalm is verse 17, which says, Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. And that destiny was not good. It is without hope. It is only eternal separation from the fountain of life. You see, the psalmist wants us to have a proper perspective. For what we see today is not the end of the story. When I was at school, we studied in our GCSE year Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. And if you know that book, you'll know that something very shocking happens in the final chapter. So the first day came and the books were being handed out. And so I opened the front cover of my book and there was written in plain words what happens in the final chapter in the, for the front cover. Now knowing the ending of a, of a novel might spoil the novel for you. But knowing the ending of God's story is of great help to us in living our lives. To have this eternal perspective. The psalmist tells us how the story will end for the evildoer and we will see later how it will end for the righteous. So we've seen what not to do and why. But it was Dostoevsky who said, try to pose yourself the task not to think of a polar bear and you will see that the cursed thing will come to mind every minute. No, to stop yourself thinking about polar bears. The way to do it is not to keep thinking, telling yourself not to think about polar bears. It's to divert yourself to a new thought. And that's what God does here. He gives us an alternative. God doesn't just give us negative commands, but positive alternatives we can give ourselves to instead. So instead of fretting about the prosperity of the wicked and envying them, what are we to do instead? Well, we're to look up to God. Take our eyes off the wicked, take our eyes off ourselves, and look to God. And we're going to look at verses 3 to 6, which is a good summary of what God calls us to do. And in those verses, we see five things. Number one, trust in the Lord. Verse 3, trust in in the Lord. It's repeated as well in verse 34. Hope in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and hope in the Lord. The psalmist calls us to place our confidence in the Lord. To put our trust in him and to hope in him. The Christian life is a life of faith. Faith in God's promises. And we need to be growing in our faith. When we see things going wrong in our world and in our lives, we need to go back to God's promises. God promises us that he is still reigning and he is still in control. Why do we trust people? If you think about people who you trust, why do you trust them? Well, it's about how, they li how they're like the attributes that they have, the qualities that they have. They're trustworthy people. And we can trust God because of what he is like. He is faithful, he is loving, and he is powerful. But it doesn't stop there. This is not an invitation to sit back and relax, to become a sort of faithful vegetable, sitting there watching the world go by. No, we're called to action as well. So verse 3 continues, trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 27, turn from evil and do good. Verse 34 says, hope in the Lord and keep his way. The faith that we have in God's promises is to show itself in action. Serving God and walking in his ways. 
It is not trust God and do whatever you like. Neither is it trust God or and test him, test his patience with your sin. Neither is it trust in our own righteousness either. No, it is trust in the Lord and do good. And the psalm gives us some examples of what doing good looks like. Verse 21, the righteous give generously. And verse 26, they are always generous and lend freely. While the wicked exploit the goodwill of others, we are called to give generously of what we have. Of our wealth, of our time, of our energy, of our gifts, for the advancement of God's kingdom and the welfare of those around us. Use what God has given you in your particular situation to carry out the work he has given you to do. Verse 30, the mouths of the righteous utter wisdom. Their tongues speak what is just. What we speak must be glorifying to God and edifying to others. We should edify others with the wisdom that comes from God. Verse 31, the law of their God is in their hearts. Their feet do not slip. It's like what we were seeing in Psalm 119. The word of God is to guard our ways. Receiving God's word into our hearts and letting our lives be governed by it. For it's from the heart that our actions come from. So take God's word as your guide and your strength and do not turn from it. Keep serving him and keep walking with God. Live the way he has called you to live and hate your sin and leave it behind. And live in the way he has called you to live. Hate your sin and leave it behind. And do not become weary of doing good. Not only are we to depend on the Lord, but verse 3, the third point is in verse 4, Take delight in the Lord. Delight in the beauty of his character and find your comfort in his loving kindness. For in him we find true satisfaction and joy in his holiness, in his righteousness and majesty. In Psalm, 30, in Psalm 43, the psalmist is feeling oppressed and rejected and what does he do? Well, he says, I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. The world likes to paint a picture of the Christian as a somber individual, scared to step out of line. But that is a lie of the devil. And we could never come to that conclusion. Never come to that conclusion reading the Bible. The Bible speaks of rejoicing and good news and blessing. Yes, the, the world likes to paint the Christian as a somber individual, scared to step out of line, someone who can never enjoy themselves. But that is a lie of the devil, and you couldn't come to that conclusion reading the Bible. 
The Bible, when talking about the believer, talks about rejoicing and good news and blessing and joy. And when we are fretting, we quickly lose our joy. We've got to come back to the Lord. Christian's joy is not dependent on circumstances or material possessions. Our delight is in the Lord who does not change. That's why Habakkuk was able to say, though the fig tree does not bud, and though there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my Saviour. Our delight is in the Lord. Are we delighting in him this morning? How do we know? Well, if you saw two people and you asked the question, and you described them as, those two people are delighting in one another, what are they doing? Well, they're probably spending a lot of time together. They're probably listening to one another and talking with one another and praising one another. Well, it's the same with God. If we are delighting in God, it will show it, show it through us spending time with him, listening to his word and coming to him in prayer and coming to praise him often. The fourth thing is to commit our way to the Lord. Commit our way to the Lord. We see that in verse 5. And that literally means rolling our burdens onto him. Cast your burdens upon the Lord and leave them in his hands. And then trust him as he works. We see that throughout the Bible. Proverbs 16 and verse 3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. Psalm 55 and verse 22. Cast your cares upon the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. We will be burdened at times in this life. But God tells us that when we are, we are to cast those burdens onto him and trust him with those burdens. The last alternative is to be still and wait, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. We're to be still and submit to the will of God in our lives, believing that God's way is best and accomplish, and knowing and trusting that he will accomplish his good purpose in our lives. Because we've got to remember and be patient, this isn't the end of the story. God does not always work to our timetables or in ways that we can understand, but he says to us, trust in me and keep going. Don't be distracted by people all around you running in different directions. You keep focused on the Lord and do not neglect him. Waiting is a hard thing to do. We struggle with it. Even waiting for a few seconds for a video to stop buffering. It's infuriating. But we will wait for it if we believe that what we are waiting for will be worth the wait. And that brings us finally to the promise. Verses 23 to 25. God promises he will keep his people. Even in the worst of times, those who place their hope in the Lord will not be found wanting. The promise is that we will be well provided for in this life and certainly in the life to come. God is the good shepherd and we shall not want. Verse 25, David looking back at his life could say that he'd never seen the righteous forsaken of his children begging bread. And we can bear witness to that in our own lives. God has provided for us, provided for our daily needs. He has supplied us with daily bread, health and shelter. 
while others may fall on the flimsy foundations they have built their lives on. We who have built our lives on the rock need not be envious of those who have built their houses on the sand. We can have joy and confidence that God will provide for his people. Though we may be afflicted, we will not be crushed. Though we may stumble, we will not be cast down. The devil, as we saw in our reading from 1 Peter, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But those that are in Christ, he will not prevail over. For Christ has won the victory over the devil. And we can take the promise seriously because the Lord has the power to keep it. And he will keep his people to the end. This is a great reassurance in difficult times that the Lord will not allow you to be overwhelmed. The power that upheld the Lord Jesus Christ is the same power that upholds the Lord's people. And Jesus, your Saviour, is standing at the right hand of God and his hand upholds us. The Lord is our security. And he will bring us to our eternal home. The second promise is that the Lord will give us our heart's desires. This is not an invitation for us to get out a wish list of the things we might like. A good job, a nice car, a nice house. No, it means that whoever delights in the Lord will want and desire the things that are in line with God's will. First John says something similar. If we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And if you are delighting yourself in the Lord, your desires will be in line with his for you. The psalm also speaks again and again about an inheritance, an inheritance. We see that throughout the psalm. Verse 11, the meek will inherit the land. Verse 18, their inheritance will endure forever. Verse 22, those in the, Lord, the Lord blesses will inherit the land. Verse 27, you will dwell in the land forever. And verse 34, he will exalt you to inherit the land. An inheritance, an eternal inheritance. Inheritance, what we know of an inheritance, it's not something that's earned, it's something that's passed from parents to children. And in the same way, God has given his children a glorious inheritance in, food, in and through Jesus. The promise here is that those who live a life of faith, walking and waiting upon the Lord and depending on him, will inherit the earth. When we serve sin, it is a cruel master that takes and takes and leaves us with nothing. But when we serve the Lord, he is a good master who provides for and rewards his servants. The Lord will see that they receive their reward and the inheritance that he gives is forever. It's not like the treasures and the pleasures of this world that are transitory and corruptible, but the inheritance that God gives is secure, incorruptible and everlasting. And the final promise is peace. The righteous have peace. We see that in verse 11. Peace in life and peace in death and peace beyond death. Peace with God and peace in God. The contrast though, as it says in, verse 50, in Isaiah 57 and verse 21, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. As we conclude, there is a crucial point that we haven't addressed yet. Where are you in this psalm? The psalm clearly talks about two separate groups. The wicked, those who do evil, sinners, wrongdoers, and the righteous, those whose ways are upright, the meek, the blameless, and the just. 
Which group do we belong to? Are we the righteous or the wicked in this psalm? Well, if we examine our lives in the Bible, we see that the Bible tells us that no one is righteous, no, not one. And none of us have lived up to this pure and righteous standard. Which one of us fits the description of the righteous given in this psalm and in the rest of the Bible? We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even the best of us. So how can we become righteous? Well, we must look to Jesus. He fulfilled this psalm perfectly. He was the true righteous one. Though the wicked seemed to prosper against him, he trusted his father and he committed his, his spirit to his father. And he kept going the way of the cross that those who trust in him might receive his perfect righteousness. Psalm 37 gives assurance to those trusting in Christ as their saviour. Those that have received the righteousness and follow in it. If you have not trusted Jesus, you can have no such assurance today. But it could be yours even today if you trust in Christ as your Lord and saviour. Amen. Our final singing comes from Psalm 37. And we'll be singing the uh, first six stanzas. We see here what we've been saying. What we're not to do, stanza one. For evildoers, do not fret yourselves unquietly, and be not envious of those who work iniquity. And why is that? Stanza two. For even like the wilting grass, they wither soon away, and like the green and tender herb, they surely fade away. What's the alternative? Set your trust upon the Lord. Do good. Continue living in the land. Joy in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. And we see the reward in stanza five. Like unto the light he will your righteousness display. Your vindication he'll bring forth like noontide of the day. So let us sing Psalm 37, stanzas one to six to the tune Denfield 73. <laughs> Like the wilting grass
we thank you for all that we've seen in this psalm. Thank you for giving it to us and giving us the guidance we need in troubled times. Lord, we pray that as we go out into your new week, that you would be near to us and keep us. Help us to keep trusting in you and doing good. Help us to commit our way to you and to wait on you, knowing that this is not the end of the story, what we see today, but trusting in your great promises that you will give your people an inheritance that will last forever, incorruptible and secure. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.